Good morning. I am Dennis Noble, a professor at the University of Oxford in England, and I'm delighted to once again come to attend your Congress to give a talk. And today I've decided to talk with the title Evolutionary Transitions and Symbiogenesis. Symbiogenesis is, of course, the ability of organisms to fuse together to form uh, a new organism, even from completely different species. And what I will show today is that that is the secret of the development of multicellular organisms as large as you and me, the elephant, the mouse, all the big organisms that now exist in the world, animals and plants, owe their existence to a very particular form of symbiogenesis. So let's go straight into the talk. It will be divided into two parts. Part one, I will show that the most important transition to enable multicellular organisms to appear was not evolution by natural selection. It was symbiogenesis, the fusion of two completely separate species. And then in part two of the talk, I will ask the question, were there any disadvantages for multicellular organisms in achieving this transition? Or did they lose the flexibility that microbes have in exchanging their DNA? And also, to finish the talk, how important is DNA anyway? First, a little bit of history. Carl Linnaeus was the first person to introduce the systematic classification of species. But he thought, like most scientists at his time in the 18th century, that all species were created separately. It was the great French zoologist who was one of the Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who was one of the first to propose that species, in fact, slowly change and evolve from each other. In fact, he drew a tree of life 28 years before Charles Darwin. Darwin's rough sketch on the right on this slide was in his notebook B, dating from 1837. It was based on his observations in the Galapagos Islands, whereas Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's tree on the left was published at the end of his great book, Philosophie Zoologique, published in 1809, just 28 years before Charles Darwin um, published his Origin of Species. Sorry, just 28 years before Charles Darwin drew his rough sketch uh, of a tree in his notebook B in 1837. Moreover, while Darwin's diagram was a very important sketch, it was, as you can see, just a sketch. It was in his notebook. I think that between A and B, there are various transitions, C and D, that can occur. Lamarck, by contrast, actually outlined what he thought the species were that formed the different parts of the tree of life. His tree started with worms. It's all in French, but I will use the English words. Started with worms at the top there and branched off to form the insects, the spiders and the crustaceans, and in the other direction, another branch to form the mollusks, 
in turn developing into fish and reptiles and branching out to form on the one hand uh, the birds and on the other the amphibia and then once again uh, branching out. It was a complete tree. Very detailed for the time. This was about the limit of the knowledge of the way in which species could relate to each other. So the idea that species slowly changed and the proof that they have done so is really something we should credit the French scientist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck with. That is not to denigrate Charles Darwin's great achievement. I'll come on to that in just a minute or two. Now let's look at how the trees of life have developed. First of all, have a look at the diagram on the right produced by Carl Woes, the great microbiologist, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences just 34 years ago in 1990. Carl Woese's great contribution based on genetic analysis, DNA analysis and RNA analysis, was to show that there were three major branches of life at its very root into the bacteria and on the left and the eukarya on the right but he was responsible for discovering a third group the so-called archaea. These are special bacteria-like organisms that can survive in extreme conditions and it was a fusion between archaea and the cells that gave rise to the eukaryotes, that's the kinds of cells in our bodies, that led to the fusion that we're talking about as the symbiogenesis between bacteria or archaea and other prokaryotes to form plants and animals, the cells that we call eukaryotes, cells with nuclei, with well, as we shall see, with mitochondria and many other organelles. Now, what this means is explained in Franklin Harrell's book, In Search of Cell History, published in 2014. Uh, this is my slight redrawing of his diagram. And what it shows is that the tree was not just a tree. Because what you'll notice there is that two major branches leading off to the left to the bacteria and to the right to the archaea um, but the connections between those trees occur across repeatedly across from one branch to another because those microbes exchange their DNA and RNAs all the time. We'll see examples of that later in the talk. And it was in fact a fusion between a proteobacterium and the early forms of cells giving rise to the beginning of eukaryote cells. That fusion is what led to the formation uh, of the branch of life along which we and other animals all lie. A similar branching from a cyanobacterium, that's a blue-green um, bacterium, led to a similar fusion to form the plants in, on the earth. Now, this theory um, was resurrected and developed by Lynn Margulis in her book Symbiosis in Cell Evolution, published in 1981. But she drew attention to the fact that she did not herself invent the idea. She always freely acknowledged that there were two Russians who worked on this idea 
before her. So first of all, before we come to the Russians, what the diagram from Franklin Harrell's book shows is the tree of life is as much a network as it is a tree. And that there were key transitions using symbiogenesis, the fusion of one species with a totally different species that created the plants and animals from combinations between different, archaea, uh, different bacteria and archaea. This was all first discovered much earlier in the 20th century by Merishkovsky, who discovered the idea of plastids or chloroplasts in plants, and Kozo Olyansky discovered mitochondria in animals. So trees are really networks. And that's partly because, as I said earlier, microbes exchange DNA frequently. Here are the two great Russian pioneers of symbiogenesis that Lynn Margulis um, acknowledged generously and fully. On the left is a diagram from Konstantin Merzhovsky's Tree of Life for the origin of plants. He shows two forms of symbiogenesis that occurred to give rise to all the various species of plants. And on the right is the cover page from Boris, from Boris Kozopolyansky's book, published in 1924, just a century ago, and he called it Symbiogenesis, a new principle of biology. It was, of course, translated from the Russian into English. Now, why does all of this matter? This diagram is from a book that I published just a year ago, together with my zoologist brother, Raymond Noble, called Understanding Living Systems, just published by Cambridge University Press in June of last year. And it shows some of the major transitions in the evolution of living organisms as we move from what must have been relatively unformed chemical soups of molecules to the stage at which organized catalytic networks could arise. We call them autocatalytic because they're self-organizing. And at some stage that got incorporated into the first cells with cell membranes, and we think that that probably had ribonucleic acid, RNA, rather than deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. The reason for that is very simple. The RNAs are much more flexible in their function than DNA. DNA is essentially a very inert molecule. It can be read to see what its sequence shows, but it cannot act as an enzyme or in any other way as the way that proteins do. Whereas RNAs can do that. And it's likely that the very first enzymes catalyzing reactions were RNAs. And then we imagine the transition to the DNA world when cells with permanent genetic memory uh, evolved. And that's where we put the major transition, the symbiosis, to form the eukaryotes. Notice, too, that we indicate on the right there that this produced an absolutely huge energy jump because those bacteria and archaea that fused with other uh, microbes to form symbiogenetic new species, those were already producing almost 10 times as much ATP as the energy producing molecule in living organisms, almost 10 times as much as could be done 
before the formation of those metabolic networks capable of producing much more ATP than before. Now, that is what enabled the next transition to occur. That is the transition to multicellularity, to the kinds of organisms like you and me. Now, why did it require that huge energy jump to make it possible? Because what I'm going to tell you now is that without that energy, it would not have been possible to form anything other than very tiny animals or plants. The reason for that is simple. Oxygen needs to diffuse in. CO2 needs to diffuse out. Up to about 50 microns, that's a very small distance, it's almost impossible for that to happen by simple diffusion. Single cells don't have a problem with that because they're only uh, a number of tens of microns in diameter. Once you get to groups of cells forming a great big colony, there is a problem. How does the center get oxygenated and how does it give off its CO2? The answer is you've got to have the energy to build and then to functionally use a heart, a muscle that can pump fluid around the body. That requires the energy. That's the reason why without the huge energy jump produced by symbiogenesis, it would have been impossible for organisms like us uh, to exist and all the other animals and plants that we know about today. I'll just quickly go through the remaining parts of the um, uh, major transitions, uh, but I'm not going to talk about those much today. There was the transition, of course, to nervous systems to enable control of larger organisms to occur, and then leading to two kinds of learning Simple associative learning. Bacteria, too, can easily work out where their food is and find a way of accessing that by association with particular chemical compounds. And then to consciousness in organisms like us, the peacock, the octopus, and we don't know how far down that might go in the evolutionary tree, but that is what produced active agency in living organisms. But the key thing I'm going to talk about in today's talk is the symbiogenetic event that led to the huge energy jump that enabled us to exist. How did that work? Well, those bacteria or archaea that fused with other prokaryotes were the origin of what in animals are called the mitochondria. Symbiogenesis, in effect, swallowed up those other organisms and they became adopted inside the cell to form uh, what we call an organelle. Not a cell in itself, but a bit cell-like. And as you can see there from the diagram on the right, it's packed with membranes. Both the outer membrane, as it's called, which is simply the uh, banana shape shape that you've got there, uh, or the boat shape, whatever you want to call it, um, and then the inner membrane, which is uh, twisted around this way and that way to produce a huge volume of surface membrane. That's where all the enzymes exist that enable the metabolism to occur that can produce large amounts of um, ATP. On the left, you can see uh, a diagram, not a diagram, this is an actual photograph of an electron microscope picture of two mitochondria sectioned uh, transversely. And you can see the extent to which the um, member inner membrane uh, crosses and recrosses the structure of the mitochondrion. And as I said, that means that uh, 
enable uh, eukaryotic cells were enabled to have a tenfold increase in ATP production. And that is why, before this evolutionary transition, large multicellular forms of life were impossible, and that's because they require circulations to distribute the respiratory gases and energy-giving molecules throughout the organism, and that requires a strong muscular pump, that is, the heart. That's the situation in the animals. The plants have a similar symbiogenetic event that produced what we call the chloroplast or the plastids. And chloroplasts perform the same function in green plants. And this was originally a cyanobacterium that entered into symbiogenesis with another prokaryote. That symbiogenetic event has enabled the largest organisms anywhere on the earth to develop. They, of course, are the giant sequoia trees in California. They can grow up to nearly 100 meters tall. Huge amounts of um, cellular production, of um, metabolism to produce all the ATP, and of course it's the leaves of those trees rising up to nearly 100 meters that generate all of that energy. The plastids, or chloroplasts, they have a similar structure, again inherited from a prokaryote, all of those many uh, hundreds of millions of years ago, and again an outer membrane and then an inner membrane that's folded backwards and forwards on itself to greatly increase the surface of the membranous structures which generate the extra ATP. So my conclusion in this part of the talk is that the most important evolutionary transition enabling multicellular organisms to evolve was symbiogenesis, which enabled much higher energy levels to develop. Animals and plants could then grow very much larger, and indeed they did. Now in part two of the talk, I want to explore the question, were there any disadvantages to this development to multicellular organisms from microbes? Well, until recently, it was thought that microorganisms have one characteristic that does not occur, or not thought to occur, originally in multicellular life forms, and that is the ability to exchange DNA and other nucleotides and proteins between each other. Those two bacteria in the electron microscope picture on the left they are rapidly exchanging DNA sequences between each other via protrusions from each bacterium meeting in the middle and fusing. It's like a little tube line that takes those uh, DNAs and RNAs uh, across uh, the space between the two bacteria. Now, this process is called conjugation. And it's one of the reasons why unicellular life forms can evolve very quickly. Bacteria have evolved very quickly to um, create a problem for us, which is that we produce the antibiotics that can kill bacteria, but our problem now is that the bacteria have become wise to that and they've mutated rapidly enough to produce strains of bacteria that are now resistant to the antibiotics. But the question I'm going to ask here is, did this ability to exchange DNA between cells, did multicellular life forms lose this ability? And as I said earlier on, it was widely thought that they had, that there was no way in which this kind of exchange could occur in big multicellular organisms. Well, the last 20 years or so, we know differently. 
This is from a paper that I've just recently published with my colleague Daniel Phillips called Bubbling Beyond the Barrier, Exosomal RNA as a Vehicle for Soma Germline Communication. It was published uh, nearly a year ago now in the Journal of Physiology. I won't take you through the great detail of this diagram, but what it's showing is that cells in multicellular organisms still exchange nucleotides and many other molecules between each other. They still behave, in other words, a little bit like the bacteria that we saw in the previous slide in conjugation with each other. And that's done not any longer by little um, protrusions from the individual cells. Um, it's done by the um, secretion of little vesicles, little membranous droplets, if you like, terribly tiny, much tinier than can be visualized in an ordinary light microscope. And each of them contains a snapshot of the control networks of RNAs, DNAs, proteins, and so on, in the cells concerned. All cells in our bodies are pouring out thousands, if not millions, of these extracellular vesicles that communicate not only with other cells in the body, but specifically, as shown at the bottom parts of the diagram, uh, specifically to the germline, the cells that in the future will form the eggs and sperm to create the next generation. That's now been demonstrated to such an extent that there are at least uh, 200 references in that review article published by Daniel Phillips and me um, just about a year ago. Moreover, as that article summarises, those control RNAs have been shown to influence the metabolism and other functions of the offspring, of the next generation. The evolution of nucleotides between organisms therefore still occurs even in multicellular organisms. So they've not lost that ability. Now I want to come to the question, yes, multicellular organisms can function to exchange DNA between their different cells, but how much nevertheless has a possible barrier mattered? Um, well, an interesting book published by the science journalist Philip Ball just this year, How Life Works, A Guide to the New Biology. Actually, that title gives the game away, doesn't it? Um, this is a new biology. It's new because it rejects the major textbook accounts of the evolutionary process. And uh, Philip Ball identifies in great detail the various processes by which organisms are so clever at organizing themselves and coping with all kinds of environmental changes that it's wrong to think of genes as the blueprint for life. The view of biology, according to Philip Ball, that is often presented to the public is oversimplified and badly out of date. So why was the genome ever called the book of life, as many call it? Creating as body and mind, to quote from Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene. Because if that were so, the conditional logic of life would have to be found in the genome. Now, I am a computer programmer. I wrote the first computer program to reproduce the process by which the rhythm of the heart occurs. And if, as a computer programmer, you look for where all the 
conditional clauses, the if this, then that, else the other. Those control routines have got to exist, but you will not find them in the genome. In 25 to 30 years of genome sequencing, nobody has found a complete conditional program in genomes. There are switches in genomes. Each gene has an area, sometimes quite close to the sequence for the gene, that is sensitive to molecules produced by the organism that can activate or inhibit the production of proteins from those genes. But those switches are controlled by other physiological processes. What happens when a new virus arrives, as it did during the COVID pandemic? Our immune system directs some of its cells to start changing their DNA, to produce all kinds of shapes of immunoglobulins, that's the proteins that grab the virus or bacterium and neutralize it, to it look for a cell that manages, by chance, to grab the new uh, attacking virus. So that deals with the question, um, are there programs within DNA? The answer is no, uh, there are no such programs. We have to look elsewhere. And I'll come on in a moment to another slide showing where those programs actually exist in living organisms. But first of all, let's just consider uh, again the question, um, what exactly do we find in the genome in addition to what we must have inherited from our ancestors long ago? Surprising fact is that a lot of that DNA, I think it's around 10 or 20%, is probably of origin from viruses that we have incorporated into our genomes. So somehow, even across species or even between a virus and organisms like ourselves, such transfer of DNA clearly happened. That's the first thing. Not too difficult to see how that can happen. A new RNA virus will, inside a cell, one of our cells, self-replicate. So produce many versions of that RNA or DNA. Then that can be transferred, as I mentioned earlier, down towards the germline cells to form the future eggs and sperm. So we come now to the question, where are life's control routines? This diagram is a diagram, a schematic diagram of a living cell. Of course, it's a diagrammatic representation. Those blue things are the mitochondria. And then there are a lot of other organelles inside. And of course, there's the membrane around the outside. Now, remember, I said that all of those membranes in mitochondria like also the surface membrane and the membranes in other organelles of the cell, those are where the control mechanisms exist because that's where you have channel proteins and receptors, receptor proteins, that can sense what the outside world is doing, what it's got chemically, what it's got electrically, what it's got mechanically, all of that can be sensed by the outer cell membranes and then the information and control routines inside the cell um, determine how the DNA is manipulated to implement those control routines. Without those membrane processes, there could not be choice between various behavioural options. The flexibility 
of organisms to change their behaviour according to the circumstances would not exist. And choice is an essential element in any theory of the ability to be selfish or cooperative. Moreover, all cells in the body have these control routines, including particularly our nerve cells. They have huge numbers of control routines using the ion channels in those membranes. Now I come to a very important point. There are no genes coding for membranes. DNA codes only for RNA and proteins. The membranes a totally different kind of molecule. They are formed for what we call phospholipids, fatty substances that can form, a bit like soap bubbles. Yet, all of those membrane structures are inherited as well as the genome. We don't arise just from the genome of our sperm and the egg genome with which it fused to form the genome that is ours. We also inherited all of this complex cellular structure because that was the egg cell of our mother. In the debate with Richard Dawkins just two years ago at a festival here in the United Kingdom, um, Richard told me, Dennis, you know, we could inscribe your DNA in blocks of granite, stones where you can inscribe uh, words, um, characters. We could scribe the C, G's, A's and T's, the sequence, into blocks of granite. We could keep that for 10,000 years and then in 10,000 years we'll make Dennis Noble again. As you know, you can't. Why not? Totally astonished. He said, Richard, where would you get the egg cell of my mother as it was in 1936? And I close with um, a little reference to this new book that has been published by my zoologist brother Raymond and me, published by the distinguished university press, Cambridge University Press, called Understanding Living System. And I wrote for that book, it will require creative ingenuity to shift the culture of biology away from the misunderstandings of the 20th century and it will be for a new generation to discover and create their own culture fit for the challenges of the 21st century and we closed with the statement it is arguably a challenge the scale of which human society has never faced before we wish them all well thank you very much for listening to me today